Hello and welcome to Prime Talk, a discussion forum from ET Prime. Uh, I'm Vikas Dandekar. Hope you and your families are doing well. Uh, with that, let me take you straight to the topic of today's discussion, uh, redefining Indian pharma through the lens of young leaders. Uh, it's been such a difficult year, uh, 2020. Uh, like other sectors, the Indian pharmaceutical industry has faced major challenges from raw material issues, people getting infected, and an enormous pressure to keep the medicine supplies intact. There is always the China factor in all of this. And then there are controversial subjects which keep coming on how drugs have been approved, uh, how, how unscientific data has been, and how companies have launched products and doctors have actually prescribed those products. In all of this, a band of young enterprising executives are at the forefront of managing companies. They have new ideas, new solutions, and the willingness to try out new things. We have with us four leaders from the industry, from our pharmaceutical industry, to share their thoughts and take a few questions. Some of them will be tough. To briefly introduce them, first we have uh, Namita Thapar, MQR uh, uh, Pharma Director, Executive Director at MQR Pharma. Uh, hi, Namita. Uh, Arjun Juneja. Chief Marketing Officer at uh, uh, Chief Operating Officer at Mankind Pharma. Hello. Hi, Arjun. Welcome. Uh, Aman Mehta, Chief Marketing Officer at Torrent Pharma. Hi, good afternoon. Hi, Aman. Thanks. And uh, finally, Sharvil Patel, Managing Director at Zydus Cadula. Hi, Hi good afternoon. Everyone. Thanks, all of you, for joining us. Uh, uh, before we start the discussion, a few housekeeping points uh, for those who have logged in. Uh, keep sending your questions. Uh, I'll try to get them answered as we progress in our discussions uh, uh, over the next uh, 90 minutes. And the uh, end of it, uh, at the conclusion, uh, we will be keeping about 20 minutes uh, to answer some of those uh, curated questions. I can tell you we have like uh, hundreds of questions which have come from the registrations alone. So there's been a lot of anticipation uh, over the last uh, uh, two weeks that we have actually started taking the registration. So uh, let's start with that uh, short introduction. Uh, actually, for me, it's a very nice new experience because I haven't been talking to them. I haven't spoken to anyone from Torrent officially. Uh, so it's good to have Aman. Uh, Arjun Juneja is also you know, someone who I have not spoken to. So for me also, it will be a discovery and a lot of learning. And of course, Sharvil, I have been uh, picking his brain from time to time. So um, another opportunity for me to do that again. So uh, to start with, uh, let me ask uh, Namita. Uh, the first section of our conversation is actually on learning and unlearning. So um, uh, you know, being the financial brain uh, of MQR, and also straddling uh, a lot of uh, operations at the organization. How has it been for you for the last one year? What have been the learnings and uh, what you would not to, uh, want to do uh, if you are given a chance or you would want to revisit those? Amita. Thank you, Vikas. Um, so I think all of us have had enormous learning in the last uh, 14 months of the pandemic. For me personally, what was um, absolutely fascinating to see is how specifically in the pharma industry, in spite of the lockdown, all of us have been coming to the office uh, from day one. And um, you know that simple quote that when you empower people, magic happens. We actually saw that because uh, amidst all the paranoia, a lack of information, getting all our workers to come to the factories and to keep manufacturing at a level where our country would not see shortages of essential drugs uh, was incredible. So the way our HR managed to get everyone to the factories and keep the production going, the way my rep, so now in addition to finance, I manage the India business, and the way our 6,000 medical representatives went all over India and at a time when PPE kits and masks were not available, we made sure we got them and we gave them to all the doctors, as many doctors as we could. I mean, it was just, magic um, and you know the agility with which people acted so i think um, this is a time when uh, there's no playbook there's no rule book that teaches you what to do and people have to be agile people have to be resilient people have to be creative um, and we saw a lot of that happening in the pharma industry uh, it was truly phenomenal to see that but 
you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. A lot more needs to be done. Sure. So that was one part of the question. Uh, what would you want to do differently if you are given a chance? Probably something that could have been done better. I think there's a whole host of learnings, right? But, um, you know, one of the biggest learnings has been how can we use digitization more effectively, not just in pharma, but also to address the access and infrastructure issues in a country like India with a population of our magnitude. Um, there's definitely a steep learning curve required there. Of course, I mean, Vikas, you saw that we started as a country that did not have PPE suits, and then we became a country that became self-sufficient in that. Same thing, you know, there are a lot of uh, companies that are coming up with vaccines and innovation in that. Um, you know, when it comes to ventilators, we managed to get a lot more and make the country a lot more self-sufficient. So we have done a lot, but when you look at the loss of lives, I think if we were better with our infrastructure, our digitization, um, we could have done a much better job. So there's enormous learning, but nothing goes to waste. And I'm an optimist, and I truly believe that we've learned uh, to make it better in the third wave and in the future. Sure, absolutely. Right. Uh, can I have Aman uh, coming in next uh, on what has been the organization's experience in the last 12 months? How have you managed uh, you know, to keep things smooth? Uh, what have been the challenges? I absolutely echo Namita's thoughts on how, uh, uh, firstly, uh, safety of employees has been at the forefront. Uh, uh, so in response to the pandemic, uh, there was a quick kind of uh, policy response that was required by all organizations, which was instantly done. Uh, in terms of uh, learnings, I think uh, not just as a company, but as an industry and as a uh, overall healthcare ecosystem, uh, what we saw was that uh, uh, the pandemic didn't really create any cracks. It, it just exposed those cracks in a much more visible way. So how do we look at how we can fix them as fast as possible? So for example, if we can have uh, a separate fund for such future prevention in the uh, prevention in the future to have, let's say a stockpile of drugs ready next time, uh, even basic drugs, it doesn't have to be the, the complex injections and so on, because we know many of these have been in, in a, a tough supply situation for various reasons. Uh, so how do we better prepare ourselves for uh, such a future occurrence is something that certainly all of us have learned. Uh, and of course, we have to keep uh, safety at the forefront of whatever we do from here. Perfect. Right. Uh, uh, you want to come in next, Arjun? Uh, you, your domestic market forms the bulk of your uh, total revenues. So you must have done a lot of things uh, on ground. So Vikas, thank, thank you so much for having us here. So basically, I mean, you know, if I were to just recap our journey, uh, starting uh, March end or April last year, I would say it's been it's been a very you know a roller coaster kind of a ride. You know, the first few months initially when COVID was new for the entire world, you know, no one knew how things uh, are going to end up. Uh, if we talk about our manufacturing plants, you know, the government was shutting down the plants if there was even a single positive case. Uh, the supply chain had gone for a toss. Doctors were not, uh, in fact, uh, meeting uh, patients or, you know, practicing, you know, it was difficult for our MRs to meet them. So there were a host of different problems, you know, which uh, we had to go through. And uh, I think the biggest of them was that, you know, we need to ensure that the medicines are available on time. There are no supply chain disruptions. I think that's what kept us going. And I think for the first time, I would say that I saw we as an industry, you know, everyone collaborated together. You know, there were <clears throat> different associations and uh, different groups formed uh, between the different companies and industries. And, you know, we were all helping each other, whether it was any supply chain disruption, any raw material shortage, any packing material shortage. So everyone was collaborating. And this was the first time, you know, I thought that uh, we are not just, uh, you know, working for ourselves. We are working as an industry as one together. So I think that was the biggest learning for us. Uh, being present in the domestic side of things, uh, I mean, things were really difficult. It was, I mean, people were, get, I mean, there was a lot of scare about COVID, you know, people were dying, people were getting infected with COVID. In fact, there were people who were going uh, to the warehouses or to the manufacturing plants or to the research centers. I mean, they were all scared. Their families were scared. 
a lot of these people you know who work they live on rental houses or you know pg type of accommodations you know the owners of those places were scared they were not letting them come back to their uh, homes from the workplaces so there was a host of challenges and i think we as an industry everyone came together you know combined and in fact i would also like to you know give the credit to the government as well you know the people from the government whether it is department of pharmaceuticals or ministry of health or even the local authorities you know they were constantly interacting with the companies with the industry and you know whatever suggestions were made at that time i think a lot of them were accepted and you know uh, we were given full cooperation as a whole right so do you think uh, things have come back to normal the pre covid times or is there still some hesitation uh, because what we see from the market uh, you know uh, talk is that uh, doctors are still not very comfortable uh, meeting uh, medical reps and uh, whether that will change things forever from here no you are absolutely right doctors are still not comfortable meeting the medical reps there are i mean especially doctors in the bigger towns are not meeting the medical reps and uh, somewhere at smaller towns the medical reps are meeting there's a lot of lockdown kind of a situation in most of the states so even the mrs are not stepping out of their houses to meet the doctors at the same time you know we also saw that since the last one one and a half month ever since the second wave came in doctors are overwhelmed with patients they don't have time to meet our mrs so i think for doctors right now the priority is to treat the patients and help them get out of this and uh, i mean we are assisting the doctors in <clears throat> any kind of uh, help they need to treat the patients in making the medicines available but this second covid wave for us as an industry is pretty different from than what it was in the first phase there were a lot many disruptions than there have been this time right right perfect yeah so i'll come back to you on a couple of other related questions uh, uh, let me ask uh, sharvil uh, now uh, right from the start of the pandemic uh, from supplies of hcq uh, also vaccines which will be coming up now uh, you have had some presence in almost most of the product categories you know interferon the virafin then there was viro shield then there is remdesivir of course where you actually crashed the price to 999 uh tell me about your philosophy of how you have actually been uh, managing this again there have been pressure about whether the products that have been approved have been duly scientifically tested and given the approval with the right processes sure thank you uh, so my, so i think uh, if you take the whole year gone by and if you analyze the whole year i think one thing we have learned very clearly and it's humbling experience that we are not able to fully be ahead of this whole pandemic uh, the virus keeps on uh, you know we still don't understand enough about what's going on and how do we tackle something like this so i think in this period of uncertainty uh, you know what has really come out as for us as a company and for the industry itself is that they have really you know really imbibed the true principles of how do you fight something called vuca which is this whole volatility uncertainty complexity and ambiguity and in every part of it right the industry took a very bold step in terms of being able to be at the forefront you know keeping your plants open when we didn't have protocols uh, you know taking risks during that time uh, you know working with the authorities both at the district level and state level and then the overall as the industry to make sure we came out with the guidelines i think one important aspect of what the pharmaceutical sector did is come out with good guidelines in terms of how you manage your workspaces and workplaces so i think that was very good the second thing specific to your question also is that i think the need of the hour was the first principle of what most of us have been doing so far is access and affordability right you create access for medicines especially when there is a demand surge that happens because of specific needs that are there and i think as an industry uh, everybody uh, was able to you know scale it up to five times 10 times of what needed to be done you know while you know we all talk about what we did and you know we produce lots of material we took lots of inventory we have at the same time written off a lot of inventory also which people don't realize but you know the risk that the pharmaceutical industry took was in a magnitude very large if you just look at hc uh, if you look at remdesivir you know the seven manufacturers are probably taking risk of thousands of crores and uh, all on their own so similarly if you take about any other molecule when companies are you know stockpiling apis or excipients or manufacturing this 
you know, they did take enormous amount of risk to make sure that these drugs were made affordable and accessible to the country. So I think that's the first good part. With respect to the science of whether these were shortcut, bypassed, if we did, I don't think so. All trials have gone through the same process, which is pass, going through the uh, early work and then the SECs. And the only thing that has helped us this time is that this, there has been a priority to anything that comes through for COVID. So, you know, the SECs are called very often and very frequently. You know, decisions, discussions happen much faster. There is less regulatory hurdles in terms of the processes that are involved with it. We still have to go through all the steps, but you know, the time taken for everything is faster. So I am sure there is there is some room to say that uh, some more time is required uh, to know what is the real outcome or efficacy or some of the other things. But on the safety part, I don't think there has been any compromise uh, by any of the most of the times in terms of whatever has been approved in the country. And many of these drugs are repurposed drugs. So repurposed drugs have already have a proven uh, safety, at least, if not uh, efficacy. Uh, and there are some which are investigational new drugs, which require a far, far higher burden of safety to be proven. Uh, but I think by and large, I think we have, we have done a decent job in terms of creating access for these medicines. I do believe that the use has been indiscriminate. Uh, you know, we, we, we all have seen the kind of prescriptions that are getting generated for the want of, again, uh, lack of knowledge of how to treat this uh, uh, disease uh, and this pandemic. But I think we have now better policies, better pro protocols that have come up. And I feel uh, going forward, I think we're far more prepared for the, uh, you know, whatever is to come versus what we have been able to handle so far. So I think more discovery will happen. I think we, I, my strong belief is we always need a, a therapeutic while vaccines have shown a great uh, you know, data in terms of being able to prevent uh, severity of disease or uh, you know, mortality. But definitely we are not being able to stop the flow of, um, or the spread of infections. Uh, or, uh, so that we have to still find a stronger candidate uh, or candidates which will potentially help uh, treat this. You know how the whole HIV, uh, you know, thing spread apart. Now we have a cocktail of molecules that treat for HIV in different formats. Same is for hepatitis C, which is another virus. And we have a cocktail of products that treat for that. And we have uh, very good results now with showing strong efficacy. So I believe that the future will also hold a cocktail of some antivirals or some type of products which will treat for this. And that discovery and research effort is on by every company, both within India and outside. So I think all in all, I think good work done, and uh, but still a lot more to be done. I think we have still not finally gone ahead of the curve in terms of how to tackle with this virus. Right. So uh, one question which has been, uh, uh, you know, very interesting about uh, how you moved your uh, pricing to nine ninety nine uh, per vial of uh, Remdesivir, uh, bang in the middle of the pandemic, because at that time I think the the prices quoted in in the parallel black market was even 20 25000 and then uh, you know it came down to your price was the bottom uh, and then there was uh, discussions with the government and then the other companies also uh, brought it down not to the level of uh, uh, zydus cadilla uh, but why did you do that i mean it could have been uh, at the same rates right no, so I think from the very beginning, our view was very clear. We we will price, at least in the, during the pandemic, price things uh, more affordably. Because these are, again, let's understand, we are, we are not doing any critical effort on marketing or creating a market for this, right? What we are trying to do is making sure these drugs are accessible. And it's an interest for every all of us, because as soon as we're able to come out of this crisis, we all come back to our ways of doing business normally. As a principle for our company, uh, all the way starting with HCQ, you know, HCQ we still sold at lower than the NPPA approved price, and it's not a very expensive drug to sell. So our philosophy in the organization has been very clearly that we will make the drug more affordable than what the current mode of treatments would be. Uh, so we definitely did that for uh, Remdesivir. You know, earlier our price was 2800. That was still the lowest price uh, before in the wave one. And then we saw that the real need for the drug is even more and you know, more families are getting affected. Uh, we decided that we would bring it down to as low as possible just to make sure that we don't, uh, you know, at the same time, don't lose money uh, while doing so. But I think that is that that every company has done. Every company has looked at how do they bring the price, drug prices down. You know, when we launched our Viraswin, which is a pegylated interferon, I mean, that drug takes 60 days to make one batch. 
however you know when we price it we made sure that it is at the currently it is at one fifth the cost of the current treatment uh, which probably the standard of care is remdesivir in moderate to severe patients so i think our our journey has been that at least for this covid part of the portfolio we will make the drugs more accessible and and uh, price it such that it more people can be benefited and you know the cost on a person or a family is huge right now so i think whatever any all of us do is is good for the society are you still seeing some pressure on uh, remdesivir uh, because some clinical management guidelines have been changed and modified so it came like a tsunami and it probably will fade away like a <laughs> whatever it is so you know we were told to make 30 times of what we used to make we ended up at maybe 15 times of what we could make and maybe the demand now is not even that so it's a big risk right i always have been saying that it all looks good and people feel very happy look the pharma companies are doing so well but you don't know the underlying risk that one is carrying uh, with these drugs but definitely this drug i personally believe has had a role to play in the current uh, second wave that went through and uh, it will still be an important drug but maybe you know the whole new, i think it was it was the whole fear factor that got created right everybody maybe was you know every time somebody got covid positive a prescription was written for remdesivir because remdesivir was not available so even if a person needed it or didn't need it the remdesivir prescription was out there and people were searching for that drug so there was a whole demand that got created which was not maybe commensurate in terms of the use of it uh, which has now eased and maybe now we are at a more level demand in terms of what is required for the country uh, so i think that we have gone through and it always happens in times of crisis whenever people realize that the drugs are short the it exaggerates the whole situation it becomes even more dire in terms of what is required so i think that's what we have gone through in this case and i feel the learning which i think arjun or raman also said is that this here is where the government and in, and the industry need to come together and do a stockpiling because we can't uh, i mean it's been a, it has been a stressful effort to produce so much uh, in such a short period of time and uh, it's not something one likes to do all the time because you know it's while i talk about the stress the stress at the workplace which is the people who are producing these medicines in when you had a huge wave and where at least 20 30% of our workforce was infected somewhere or the other or not being able to attend work and we had to produce the triple or four times what we had to i don't think we should be in that situation again so i think stockpiling is very critical every country does it and i think the in india also needs to do it and with the partnership with the industry somewhere that mechanism needs to work out that how do we stockpile covid medicines so we are much more prepared better prepared for the next onslaught because let's be very clear we don't have an answer for covid we know how to restrict it but we don't have an answer to how to cure it yet so until we know that we need to be still prepared for whatever is to come right absolutely Yeah, and uh, you know, parallel to your COVID efforts, uh, the efforts on other uh, medications have also continued, and uh, that was a heartening information yesterday when you launched your Cadzilla uh, biosimilar, the an antibody drug conjugate uh, of uh, trastuzumab, uh, and then that that price crash of eighty percent that also is a is an important step uh, to make drugs aff affordable and accessible. No, so I, as I said, I think for everybody in this panel, I think the first principle that we all have built our business on is creating access, uh, and that's how we have done well uh, for ourselves. Uh, so I think that will continue, and that uh, you know that part of our industry will remain buoyant, uh, whether it is us or any other uh, organization. Uh, right. And right. Uh, that's what we continue to do today. Uh, but as many of us, we also want to pivot towards also creating more discovery-led programs, creating more. differentiated programs you know we uh, our countries need different kinds of treatments uh, we have gaps in terms of what we have as a disease burden and we don't have answers for so i think it's a two pronged approach you know in every company's evolution everybody's at a different stage so you know but access and affordability is the fundamental i mean i always say that unless we do that well we will never be able to build on any other pillar so or sure. like of what we want to do so i think that will continue for all of us and for us and whether it is biosimilars or it is vaccines or it is small molecules uh, if we are obviously not the innovator uh, we will obviously our our role is to make the product more accessible and that's what we have to do sure absolutely right uh, let me uh, rotate back to uh, namita now on uh, 
you know, I've heard from both you and uh, uh, Sharvil about risk taking. Uh, you worked in uh, US also in guidance and, uh, you know, the culture there, the organization, how it works. Uh, guidance itself being a medical device company, I think it got take, taken over by Johnson & Johnson later, right? So uh, what have been the way you have actually tried to replicate those principles and models uh, which you learned from there uh, in the US uh, to India? Obviously, you know, it's like chalk and cheese generics have, are, are, are not to be compared with innovators, but in, in terms of uh, any principles that you followed here? So Vikas, um, I worked for over six years in the US, uh, both at Guidant, which is now Abbott, actually. The Stend business was taken over by Abbott right. and uh, also GSK for some time. And um, you know what I really learned from there and we brought at MCure is a deep-rooted um, appreciation for systems and processes. So when we talk about scale, when we talk about access, um, of course, people are very important, but at some point, uh, you have to be a very system and process driven company if you really want to scale uh, at some point. The second thing that I learned from there is the absolute um, focus on data analytics. Um, this is something that, you know, I mean, the, 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 there's just so much you can talk about. And data analytics is something that we've used uh, through our Salesforce portal automation portal. It is something we've used in our R&D. It's something we've used in our manufacturing just to enable us to make better decisions. And overall, when I'm talking about having stronger systems, having uh, more focus on data analytics, it's all about digitization and how to use that more effectively. So I think in the US, uh, the deep rooted belief in systems and processes in data analytics and in digitization uh, is something that I try to bring to a large extent at MCure. Um, the second aspect is, of course, capability building. So, you know, we all have very large field forces. And when we meet at IPA, we always talk about how sometimes the B farm, the skilling may not be adequate to uh, really get you prepared for the real world. And so when we have a medical representatives joining us, how do we really, uh, you know, build capability Again, digitization plays a big role. These are some of the things that we can do very effectively. And these are some of the uh, important lessons that I learned. Not that we weren't doing it in India, but I think we're talking about taking it to the next level, Vikas. Right. Uh, a word on risk, risk taking, uh, you know, because that has been the at the core of research. I mean, you have to keep investing and investing. And uh, you have related very closely on mRNA vaccines, uh, your, your uh, subsidiary company. Uh, how are you seeing this whole situation panning out? What if it doesn't work? I mean, have you factored in those risk uh, capabilities? I think that's a great question. And, you know, MQ is very proud to be the first company to hopefully bring the mRNA vaccine out. We've started our phase one trials. And uh, I must say it's not easy because, you know, there are all these criteria in phase one and especially getting patients who are 55 to 70 year old who have not got vaccinated and not got COVID, right? Um, and then getting them effectively screening and enrolling. Um, clinical trials are not easy. Clinical trials are not for everybody. And that is an enormous amount of risk taking both in terms of funds, energy, time that a company dedicates. And not just the trials, but, you know, like Charvel, who's uh, also bringing out his vaccine, can um, appreciate and can, um, you know, concur with me, is the manufacturing capability, right? So it's one thing to bring out an effective vaccine. It's another thing to, at risk, manufacture the right number of doses and then invest in the supply chain to effectively distribute it. So the whole vaccine game is a case study in innovation um, that pharma companies in India have taken up uh, very, very effectively. And there are companies that have invested a lot of human resources, a lot of money in making sure that right from the pre-trial stage in terms of getting the approval from the government to the clinical trials, to the manufacturing bandwidth, and then the distribution is taken care of effectively. Um, so we um, you know, do not think the mRNA will not work. Uh, but um, we have put in our 100% in making sure that uh, phase one gets done 
you know, in the in the near term, hopefully in the next 15 to 20 days. And we're very gung ho about um, our, starting our phase two trials as well, Vikas. Uh, would it be okay for you to share exactly how much of investments have gone in uh, at this point of time? Uh, not at this point, because, you know, this is still so early in the game. And like I said, phase two is going to start very shortly. We have to right. get approval for our protocols based on phase one. Sure. And, uh, you know, we're a company that always believes in let the numbers speak, let the results speak. So I really don't want to speak ahead of time. Uh, it, right. It's just a little premature to talk at this point. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious because most of the studies, um, you know, the comparative trials have actually given mRNA uh, the maximum mark. So, you know, 88%, 90%. So the anticipation is also very high. So yeah, good luck on that. Uh, Thank you. Uh, right. Uh, Aman, uh, to you, uh, a question, you know, uh, you've moved from Torrent Power to Torrent Pharma and, you know, nowhere it comes anywhere close to getting linked. These are very different sectors. How has been the adjustment for you? You are uh, handling the most complicated part of the, this thing. It's all about revenues. It's about marketing. Uh, tell me about your experience from the shift to how you are actually at the driver's seat? Yeah, I would say the transition from one sector to the other uh, was one of the most uh, challenging yet fruitful experiences I've had to uh, go through so far. Uh, in the sense that they're both very different in terms of customers' uh, operations. Uh, but one very important piece of advice that I received during that time was to uh, essentially completely unlearn everything you know about one sector and then start from scratch in the new one because not everything that you know about one sector will apply to another. There are so many nuances and differences in pretty much every aspect of a sector which will be different. And if you assume that X will work in Y, it will lead to suboptimal decision-making. Uh, you will not be able to understand where you might be going wrong. Uh, so I think that though it took a bit of a longer period, I think that certainly has helped a lot that uh, being able to completely unlearn uh, the basics of what I knew in, in one sector, which was the energy sector uh, and moving into this one. So th that's certainly been a, a fruitful uh, journey so far. Um, is, is, is it clear now? Yeah. All right, okay, I'll, I'll be on uh, off video. So no, what I was asking Aman was about uh, his uh, experience about dealing with the generic How do you handle that kind of a complicated business of keeping the, the ball moving, you know, the, the getting the average targets every month? How do you do that? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, overall, if we see uh, uh, as, as an organization, Torrent has been uh, uh, in uh, operations for about uh, 50 years now, and the sole purpose of the operation, found, founding of the company, was to provide access to uh, patients at an affordable cost, which Charvel mentioned, and uh, the rest also strongly believe. And particularly in our case, we were uh, a purely a, a CNS-oriented company uh, for practically the first 15 years. Uh, our uh, operations solely focused on uh, psychiatric drugs, neurological drugs. Uh, so that kind of uh, uh, culture that has been set within the organization uh, and in, in the Indian generic industry to focus on providing as large and wide of an access to patients wherever uh, there isn't uh, affordable medication present. That's what drives you every year to, to figure out where to go next, what can you do more, uh, and, and so on. So that's how the ball has been rolling for several years. And we're just building on the previous, every five years, we kind of put our learnings together and see what we've done well in the last five years, what we've not done so well, and how do we build on this uh, better going ahead. And uh, also in the pure sense of the word, uh, I personally don't believe, and, and the rest on the panel will also agree that uh, uh, Indian generic companies are now purely generic companies. Uh, of course, uh, there is a vast difference between uh, innovator and generic, but uh, everyone uh, has significant investments in research and development, uh, as, as mentioned. Uh, so there is this hunger and appetite for all to now move uh, towards uh, uh, discovery research, uh, NDDS research, uh, and so on. So I think overall, as Torrent also, we are 
uh, kind of gearing towards that phase that how do we now make this transition from uh, uh, what we've been able to do well so far. Now, how do we take this and build on this further for the next phase of uh, uh, growth and value creation? Uh, so I think uh, uh, what, what has worked so far in the industry has been focused on accessibility. Now what should work is how do we fill in the gaps of more unmet needs uh, for a larger number of patients. But of course, for all of that to work together, that it has to be coupled with several factors and not just the risk appetite of one company or five companies together. Uh, everything has to be seen in the context of the environment that we're in. And uh, uh, that's probably where the, the developed world has seen so much more success in research and development. Uh, uh, because there are there is so many enabling factors such as universal access to healthcare, uh, government support in research, uh, collaboration in universities, and so on. So while we're certainly heading in that direction now, uh, slowly but gradually, that's where we also feel that uh, a torrent along with the Indian companies uh, would be playing an important role. It's certainly a far way out for us to uh, to see that day, but uh, uh, gradually we are heading in that direction. I think we don't have him right now, so I think at least us four can maybe talk a little bit about uh, some of the points that uh, I think Aman was also carrying forward on the whole uh, innovation or the drug discovery side. So I think my personal point of view to add to what Aman said is also that today in India, we are missing this whole risk capital that is required to do uh, you know this kind of path-breaking research, whether it is vaccines, whether it is some new therapies. And I, I you know if you take a view of how this whole thing is evolving, maybe the developed markets and now China uh, and others, you know, they've, China, if you look at it now, has gone far ahead in terms of what they're doing in the biotech side, where they're probably becoming one of the few guys who will be strong innovators in the future. And I think it's high time for us uh, through the help of the industry, but also the government to come up with some mode to see how there is risk capital available for you know companies uh, professionals universities or a mix of all to collaborate and and you know do this vaccine is obviously been one aspect of what we're trying to do but a little too less and too late uh, but i think there is tremendous amount of opportunity if, uh, if uh, that kind of ecosystem gets created in the country you know for the last 12 years when i've been we have been researching saroglitazar unless somebody sees dollar value put to it it's completely discounted so I think some of you all will face those kind of challenges in your kind of work that you guys are putting in. And oh, it's pretty disheartening sometimes to see that when you're putting in a lot of effort, unless you wear a different hat or the investors wear a different hat, it's very difficult to uh, so sorry. do some of So this. sorry. Hi, uh, guys, I'm, I'm really sorry. I mean, this has been really bad this side. No worries, Vikas. Yeah. The discussion on... Yeah. Innovation. Okay, because we continued our discussion on innovation while you were gone. Okay. So you were, Sharvil was just talking about the importance of getting risk capital. Um, and how investors oh, yes. need to look differently at pharma. Right. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, it got cut at a very uh, important juncture. So, uh, I'd prefer to be invisible because that's what works better. I think I have to shift to my phone. I'm so sorry. And apologies for this interruption. So uh, uh, I missed some part of what Aman was mentioning, uh, but uh, I was wanting to come to uh, the point of uh, uh, on, on three important uh, groups, uh, subjects on, on role of innovation and technology, uh, the importance of serving a patient, and then uh, what Aman was actually alluding to on the need of uh, uh, taking the next big leap. So uh, anyone wants to dwell on that subject on exactly how do you want to uh, leverage on new technology? I've seen a bunch of Indian companies uh, looking at uh, you know, consolidating uh, data through acquisition of uh, uh, PharmaTrack and uh, PharmaRack uh, in the last uh, uh, one and a half, two months. So any thoughts on that? Uh, do you want to go first, uh, Namita? I think you mentioned uh, two points here. One yeah. is you mentioned about patient centricity. And yeah. second, you mentioned about the important of, importance of both data and digitization. So I'll answer it in those two parts. 
Um, I think we all keep talking about access. So patient centricity is obviously extremely important. And in our country, uh, when you look at the statistics, you see that there's a tremendous uh, lack of awareness, firstly. And secondly, the drop off between awareness to diagnosis and then diagnosis to treatment is significant. Not only that, once a person is treated, the compliance is a very big concern. So all this is the patient centricity that we are talking about. And this is where uh, data and digitization can play a very big role. Um, and you know, we spoke about telemedicine. So the new telemedicine uh, rules were brought out in March of last year. Yeah. But unfortunately, this has not picked up to the extent that it should pick up in a country that needs it as much as we do. Um, so, you know, when you look at US and China and you look at their telemedicine adoption uh, for patient centricity, for compliance, for reducing the burdens on tertiary care, uh, they have done a much better job than India. And I think part of it is also in terms of the learning curves of our doctors, our patients, getting them more educated and digitally savvy, also making telemedicine a part of insurance which US and China have done very effectively. So I think when you talk about patient centricity, uh, that is extremely important. Awareness is important. I mean, I'm uh, MQ is the biggest women's health company and 50% of Indian women are anemic. Most mm -hmm. don't even know they're anemic. Um, you know, later on, we can talk about uh, one of my initiatives around that, but that's for a later time. So patient centricity, a lot needs to be done. Your second point on data and pharma track and companies investing in that, um, there is a lot that needs to be done from an efficiency perspective where pharma is concerned. So whether you're talking about managing the supply chain better, the availability yep. better, expiry, stock returns, um, there, there is a lack of accurate and adequate data. And so pharma track and a lot of other measures that pharma companies will be taking aggressively is towards equipping pharma companies with this accurate um, and essential data. So it empowers decision-making and also make sure that, you know, the wastages in the system are minimized, if not eliminated. And that's the need of the hour because. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And in fact, the, the part that you mentioned about your initiatives uh, um, uh, in addressing the women's health issue will also be very important in terms of addressing the needs of the patient. Uh, and you taking the, the front role is is uh, really inspiring because I haven't seen that kind of uh, initiative taken by uh, you know families uh, promoter groups uh, directly. So it's uh, I mean, would like to hear more about that as well. Uh, 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 on to you, uh, Arjun. Uh, it'll be interesting to hear about your thoughts on. I mean, I'm I'm coming back to you more and more about domestic market because. You know, I mean, back in those about four or five day years ago, I used to see uh, on trains. Uh, the mankind posters, which used to say like, you know, uh, towards 2,500 crore, towards 3,500 crore, uh, you kind of got the rhythm of the market so well. Uh, what will be your thoughts in kind of making a, a genuinely technical approach, technologically oriented approach to addressing the needs of the market? So because I'm a very firm believer of the fact that, you know, with every adversity comes an opportunity. I'll, I'll give you an example of a lobster. So basically when, when a lobster grows, it, it, it sits in a shell, you know, and uh, you know, for, for it to grow any further, it needs to get out of the shell. So what it does is, you know, it, uh, it uh, gets rid of a shell when it grows in size, you know, gets into a bigger, she makes a bigger shell. When it grows into bigger size, you know, breaks, the second shell gets into a third shell, you know, protects itself by putting itself under a rock. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when things are very uncomfortable for you and uh, there are adversities, you need to think of out of the box. And when you think out of the box, you become very creative. And that's what mankind's been. I mean, that's what our journey has been. We are probably one of the last... Uh, starters amongst the big pharmaceutical companies in India. Mankind was started in 95 mm -hmm. and we are amongst the top five domestic companies in India now in 25 years. So one of the main reasons why we have reached this level has been we've been quite creative the way we sell. If you mentioned about that, you read those uh, posters, you know, reaching 2,500 or reaching 3,000. 
So the, the reason why we had those posters, you know, if you happen to come to our office as well, you know, you'll see posters of our vision, our mission, where we want to see ourselves in the next few years. The reason why we put these things out in public is that, you know, we are reminded by people who come meet us. We are reminded by public, you know, this is what you have to achieve. We like putting ourselves under pressure. I've always taken the example, you know, when you cook in India, the best utensil to cook and most of the Indians cook in a pressure cooker. And pressure cooker mm-hmm. mein sabse khana banta because everything is under pressure there. So that's how we treat how we work in mankind. You know, we like to think ourselves as if we are in a pressure cooker kind of a situation and we take things in a very, you know, pressure cooker kind of a way. There is a lot of pressure from top to bottom. And that's how we whistle and that's how we, we create and we think out of the box. Right. You completely changed from your, uh, your, your cricket uh, to a complete business executive. <laughs> that's an interesting story. Yeah. So basically, my dad never wanted me to get into the business. I mean, he always wanted me to be a cricketer and I was quite fond of it and I was good at it as well. But, uh, you know, things weren't really happening for me when I was uh, 23, 24. I had to take a call whether to, you know, pursue further some studies. I've, I've never been a science person. I've always been a commerce person. Mm-hmm. And then I had to take the hard call. You know, I had, I, had, I had a rough one year with him. You know, we were at odds, both of us, uh, when I decided to quit it. But uh, finally, I did it. And, uh, you know, it was very tough for me. And it still remains my first love or mm-hmm. first passion, if you were to say. Right. And uh, yeah, I miss it. Yes, absolutely. No, I mean, and then there are, uh, you know, legend stories about, you know, when people talk about uh, crisis, they actually take examples of how pressures uh, have been uh, uh, managed by cricketers uh, in their uh, most difficult situations and then replicated them in, in business situations. Have you done that? Have you taken those lessons? I mean, even uh, right now, since the last one one and a half year, it's been a pressure cooker for everyone. I'm sure everyone on the panel would agree. You know, every day is a new day for all of us here in pharma. You know, we wake up in the morning and uh, I I mean, at least for myself, I wake up in the morning and I don't want to see my WhatsApp with some bad message, you know, something (laughs) is happening there or something. Every day is a firefighting kind of situation. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Before. And uh, yeah, I mean, in the last, I mean, I've been working in Mankind since 2009 now. And uh, it's been 12, 12 odd years now for me. And I've learned a lot. I mean, the first couple of years, you know, being from a commerce background and having no idea about business. I mean, <laughs> first couple of years were a big learning experience for me. And after that, I mean, after that, it's been, it's been, it's been quite an interesting journey. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, so we'll move to the next uh, part of our uh, conversations. Uh, we've, uh, you know, Namita spoke about the role of uh, technology and the need of data analytics in terms of uh, understanding the markets better and uh, reaching access. Uh, uh, w- one important point that I have been actually prompted to by many of the people who are actually logged in is about the next uh, big step. Uh, Aman uh, spoke a little bit about, you know, how you want to look at uh, the business beyond generics and, uh, you know, more I see uh, uh, companies like Merck, uh, which kind of got the first approval from the US FDA for Keytruda. I mean, each of their quarters, they are making $4 billion. Of course, I mean, it's on expanded indications and uh, you generally often don't stumble upon a breakthrough product like Keytruda, but I was just thinking on what will be your uh, next big leap, uh, starting from you, Arjun, uh, because you know the last four, three and a half, four decades have been built on access, affordability, the loop, the the kind of uh, uh, gaps that you've seen in the Indian market. Uh, but for you, uh, will it be very different from what has been built by your, uh, you know, founder family? I think the next uh, few years, at least the next 10 years, I would say, and in fact, starting the last couple of years, have been very different for us. You know, we understand that, you know, future is not going to be like the way it was for us. I mean, if we were to start another mankind today and, you know, do the same things which we did 
10 years ago or 15 years ago i don't think so we'll be able to create mankind in the same the same way we've created as of now because times are different things are different i think nowadays you know times of our innovation whether it is related to product innovation or innovation to selling innovation and digitization as a lot of us spoke about so i mean we feel that uh, i mean as a lot of people talked about whether it's related to discovering new molecules or ndds talking about new drug delivery system or vaccines or biotechnology i mean we i mean for us as mankind we ventured into otc as our next segment i mean we feel that uh, for the domestic market you know it's it's, it's kind of kind of a close uh, complementary business uh, otc to ethical uh, pharmaceutical selling so we feel that the next leg of growth for us would come from there and mm-hmm. apart from that we are also investing heavily into biotechnology whether it is related to plasma therapies or mm-hmm. you know, the maps or the or the other bacterial uh, related uh, biosimilars and mm-hmm. uh, we have couple of uh, candidates in the new drug discoveries st- starting with uh, Uh, diabetes where we are starting the phase 2 clinical trials so a lot of it will come from innovation while we talk about innovation we also understand that you know india is not the best of the conducive uh, environments where we don't have a good ecosystem for innovation where sharvel and others would agree you know to bring a product innovative product in india it's a big struggle you know you we are not like europe or us where where there are universities where there are government lobbies you know where there is fda who's welcoming where clinical doing clinical trials is so easy in india if you were to start a clinical trials there are 10 permissions that mm-hmm. you have to for so it's yeah. a nightmare so i mean while things are changing in india slowly but uh, nothing is going to change at a rapid pace what we as pharmaceutical uh, uh, companies or we as uh, young leaders of the companies should do is you know work with the government and to make things a little less complex in india for innovation to you know really bloom right yeah i mean that quest remains to hit that big drug which can be recognized across the world and uh, that hasn't happened at least in the the time that i have spent covering the sector uh, we came close and then again it went off very far and companies who have actually invested heavily then they backed out i mean you can name a, a, a lot of those companies but it never reached that uh, final goal but i think because uh, you will see that uh, coming soon i think uh, okay we are on the right track now i mean uh-huh. it's just it's a matter of time maybe a few years you will start see things coming up right uh, uh, dr reddy uh, dr anji reddy's book the unfinished agenda actually spoke about this on how he kind of wanted to see a, a blockbuster molecule even a, a molecule at the international level so hopefully that happens uh uh sharvil you you have done like heavily invested in research uh your thoughts on this are we like the next leap will be more of incremental generics or you think uh, uh, a bulk of it will come from your innovative molecules i'm sorry i'm i'm still being un- invisible so <laughs> uh so will you are there yeah yeah i'm here so i think so vikas and i think everybody is pointed to this i think it will be in some innovation is definitely required right to what extent of uh, we talk about innovation is every company's own uh, you know way of how they chart it out but there is a lot of room for us to to work on this there is there is capabilities but it takes a very long time to build this infrastructure in india because it's lacking in every form right not yeah. that not the only issue of talent but the whole ecosystem to do research right i was so disheartened many many years ago when this whole clinical trials policy changed in our country uh, you know there was a time when we were the strongest proponents of doing all clinical work in india today you know i can do my clinical work faster in us australia canada than in india uh, and i get my approvals faster than any in these countries than i do it in india so my whole theory of you know we could use this capability which we have in india is is hasn't come true because of maybe some misdeeds or some wrong step that got taken uh, and for that the policy became so difficult that is now easier to do work outside india than is to do it in india so i think we need definitely to relook at how do we build this ecosystem in the country because every company wants to do it but if you look at the success as you talked about ketruda structures or any other success it is a collaborative success it is a success where 
industry came together with academia it, it, you know yeah. multiple ways in which this got forged uh, you know where even big institutes like hopkins or nih partnered in many of these to do some work path breaking work and you know this is how innovation has happened and fostered across the world and, and and if you look at not only us but many other countries and i think we need to create that ecosystem because it's not the only handful of pharmaceutical companies are going to be able to uh do this work right it has to be this whole ecosystem that gets to, needs to get created uh and again as i said we need uh, we need this thinking across uh, not only by the companies or promoters but everybody inside the organization and outside you know if this ecosystem is not created it will not going to get valued today everybody looks at r and d as an expense uh, if you talk to your any of uh, you present yeah. yourself to anybody today sadly Uh, because we are so short term oriented we look at it as an expense and not as yeah. an investment and uh, you know for us if you look at our saroglidism molecule it's been 12 years i mean there yeah. are hundreds of reasons for it to be dropped uh, multiple times uh, but now we are there right now we know we have phase 2 success we are in phase 3 in the us we have orphan designation we have fast track designation but it took 12 13 years to do this first molecule uh, and it is still in clinic and uh, now we have a whole range of molecules that will come from the nc or biologic side but the whole process has been a tough one uh, and the learnings that at least we have had is that one is that you do need to build infrastructure and building infrastructure is not easy infrastructure in terms of people in terms of being able to do all this work in india uh, building facilities or building clinical cro capabilities either through partnerships or on your own i think all of these are very time consuming things and it takes years and years to do so so i think we seeded it in 2001 2002 we really pushed it in 11 and 12 and maybe by 23 24 we get to see some benefit of uh, some of this coming through and we were only able to do this because other businesses were doing well and we had money to put invest behind it and here i definitely value the role of the promoters because you know somebody has to have the foresight to put money for a period of 10 to 12 years and you know be able to explain that kind of investment that one needs to do so i think that is where you know a lot of family run businesses or promoter driven businesses have a very uh, i think significant role to play because they are the ones who can think the vision in that long term otherwise it's very difficult for a professional to talk about a 10 year 15 year r and d program uh, which may bear some fruit or not uh, and it is extremely high risk because not only are you competing against your own but you are also competing against people who are well established uh, and and you are going to talk about you know not only making it clinically successful but commercially successful the biggest role that we have now to play for ourselves is how do we make innovation successful commercially if we are able yeah. to go through the phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 and get an approval that, and that that's is exactly the whole yeah that's exactly where the challenge is right uh, shervil because you have to do trials across multiple locations uh, those costs are so high and with your limited budget for research as you rightly pointed out at the start uh, it often translates into being a cost rather than an investment yeah that's one say it depends how you look at it i know as companies we look at it as an investment but sadly because there are not enough successes today people look at it as morally like cost if you are doing generics or brand or you know specify by b2 they they understand if you talk about nc they forget so uh, so i think it's it's changing as as a lot of people said in this panel that it's changing but the change and the pace of change needs to be dramatic and it cannot be done by industry alone it has to be with a partnership between the institutions and the government because that only can bring about a major change to this whole thing and we you know i i love saying that we are the manufacturers of the world or the factories of the world i think we all move towards not being that but being really the innovators of the drug discovery we know where we are able to create value uh, and just not reduce cost and produce drugs cheaper uh, which is one critical aspect of what we do but also you know build value for us and for the future for the west uh, by launching these products in the west also and creating value for not only india but people in india but also in terms of being able to contribute back in terms of the being in the pharmaceutical industry so i think that's the game plan where most want to aspire for uh, right. it's not easy i don't think everybody succeeded but unless true collaboration happens and partnerships happen it's not mm -hmm. that one one company or one team or one can continue to do it it will be more of a collaborative effort and a ecosystem which allows for risk taking right right uh, 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 
can i can i get in uh, namita again here you know in terms of uh, probably we have about 5 or 7 minutes uh, uh, before we take questions from the audiences uh, on the role of uh, professionals in running an organization because you know that's where uh, the essence of growth lies uh, typically from the experiences of uh, indian companies also uh, you know the example of dr reddy's keeps coming uh, lupin has done that uh, cipla has also uh, slowly you know moved to professional managers uh, what do you see do you think that probably is the next leap for uh, founder families to take bring in a lot of professionals into the organization so that they can think differently uh, bring new scientific thoughts uh, think global uh, your views on that namita because uh, it's important to have a mix of both right so sharvel made a lovely point that when you're investing in uh, innovation and especially here i'd like to point out that biopharmaceuticals is the next way for the future with very long gestational periods right um a family business or the promoter family brings in the vision of that 10 to 15 year outlook so their presence in decision making is very important at the same time you need to have professionals who bring domain expertise who bring uh, a lot of uh, bandwidth and experience that all the family members may not necessarily have that width right so mko has done a fabulous job of balancing the two and, and and so have a lot of other pharma companies in india so in our case uh, the gentleman who is bringing out a mrna vaccine he is a ceo of a biotech subsidiary he is a professional from nih washington with a fabulous pedigree same thing holds good for a lot of critical positions in our company which are uh, held by very very good professionals with um, very um, diverse and uh, you know significant years of work experience and i think what is needed in a family business is to have a level of democracy and to have respect for dissent so some of the best decisions emerge when there's dissent when there's candor and when people can speak up uh, that's yeah. when the best decision happens so if you have a family business that mm. appreciates the value of candor and dissent and uh, that level of openness you have the mm -hmm. best of both worlds vikas so wonderful uh, you know this is exactly what happens in most of our editorial meetings also we fight we conquer and then we decide on what to do next so, fights are yeah. important fights are important for the best decisions to emerge absolutely absolutely completely i'd like to hear you also arjun because all through it's been uh, the juneja family which has actually built these foundations of growth uh, how do you take it ahead next i absolutely resonate with those these thoughts uh, vikas i think it's very important uh, for to maintain the right balance between the promoter family and uh, hiring the professionals because at the end of the day we all need to understand that you know we as promoters or people running the business you know we brought to a certain level which is good but to you know embark upon the next journey or to get on to the next course you know we need domain experts we are not experts i mean if you ask me i'm not an expert in a drug discovery or selling the product in the market maybe what i'm an expert at is is managing things you know i i know how to manage people so i think we as uh, promoters or uh, business driven families i mean what we should think of going forward is you know have the right professionals put the right people at the right place who bring in that kind of an expertise which is needed and you provide them with the vision uh, with the necessary resources that they need and uh, you need to have conviction with them i mean a lot of people hire in professionals but uh, they don't have a lot of patience they don't uh, bring in conviction uh, into these people and uh, you know a lot of these prof uh, professionals when they join you know after one year or two years they tend to run away so you need to give them their time but uh, going forward uh, i mean as i said i'm not an expert in everything but what i, I might call myself an expert is you know managing people and i think this is what i tell a lot of people you know it, uh, the word manager you know which which starts from an assistant manager up to the senior most manager in the organization it's all about managing things mm -hmm. we as managers have to manage people i mean we don't have to manage work ourselves i mean i would not go uh, on the bench in r and d and uh, run the experiments or i would not go into the manufacturing plant and you know 
ensure uh, that the production is happening. I need to provide the right resources, the right people, whatever they need, and provide them with the right vision, which they need, as a lot of others said. And uh, as as promoters, you know, we we also need to understand that you know sometimes we have a belief in something we have we have a vision for something which the other might not believe in and mm-hmm. uh, and if, if we as promoters have that belief that we wish to achieve uh, and it might take 5 years 10 years 15 years we should just stick to it and we should ensure right. that uh, you know whatever vision we have we are not demoralized by what an investor says or whatever balance sheet says i mean conviction of an entrepreneur is the most important thing to run a business Right, right. Uh, Aman, you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I think uh, one point that I'd just like to add here is that uh, uh, one of the most important roles along with pretty much all responsibilities that come to the CEO uh, is essentially uh, being responsible for the culture of an organization. And uh, uh, every company has a separate culture. So uh, essentially what we mean by having a professionally run organization is if you have a professional CEO to run the show without the management or involvement of the, uh, of the family who has founded the company or, or family who's uh, funding the business. Uh, Mm -hmm. If there is enough conviction in uh, the cultural fit, uh, sure, of course, it can be professionally run. So it's a matter of uh, figuring out, can you find the right person who can uh, fit in there? Apart from that, of course, there is tremendous talent everywhere in the industry, in, whether it's in marketing, whether in research. So uh, that's what uh, would, uh, that's the, essentially the mix and balance that everyone's talking about of having uh, the family plus professional uh, contribution thinking. Uh, that's what would work uh, best. Right. Um, Sharvil, your turn. So I think I echo, I think whatever everybody's saying, right, the key role, and I, I always lead it to risk, right? The only person who can take the largest bet is somebody who's invested in it in, in, in the long way, long term point of view. So I think that is, I think that it's the best of both worlds when you're a promoter run or promoter managed businesses, because you get both best of both worlds, you have the long term vision. The second part is that, you know, the core values and principles continue. Uh, in the organization, which has been a blend of people who have run the business, uh, both professionally and uh, through the family. So I think all of that gets very, I mean, it's very well, uh, you know, succession planning can happen and all of that happens, which is what has been the success for companies in India and in Europe. If you look at many of the value creating companies in the world, they Mm -hmm. have been uh, backed or led by uh, families. So I think that's been a that's how true value creation has happened and it'll i believe in it'll continue to be the model of operations and you need people because it's not that one man is driving everything you and that's never been the case even in this generation or the generation before us it has been a group right. of people who have led it uh, you can yeah. call them professionals but they, i mean most lot of people have people who have been with them for a very very long period of time and build the company with them so i think Absolutely. it's a mix of both uh, which helps uh, one grow a, and build the business and uh, if you want to take uh, risks, if you want to go into new fields, uh, you know, there you do need uh, p- uh, money and, mm-hmm. uh, and allocation of resources and funds and uh, time and attention. And a lot of this is a lot of times driven by uh, the vision and the plan that the head of the business is put for or the company head of the company puts for. It could be the board, it could be the chairman, it could be the operational man, MD or yeah. it could be you know, a whole mix of all of that, but right. all of these work and, and it's, and I say the best part of this is that because it's promoter driven, there is this, you know, the biggest risk that a professional takes is, you know, he needs to be back when things don't work well or things. Yeah. Go and you need, uh, and that's when sometimes, you know, I, I've seen many times in the role of our chairman play to I play is that you, you need to back these people because, you know, there is so much uncertainty when they're trying to do things and, uh, mm. and unless you give them that comfort and uh, if you're able to with you know take the heat so to say for a period of time then you succeed because there's a lot of questions about time also uh, it's not always that you can do things so quickly so i think yeah, all in a... all i think that's why i feel this is the best way and that's how indian companies can really uh, be the 
companies like so are in the europe as well right i think because I mean, that's what, that's what, that's just what, to add to what sharvil said you know sure, i think one sure. of the biggest example is during this pandemic you know the way at which we as pharmaceutical companies moved you know the kind of speed we had it was only because of you know a lot of us are promoter driven and uh, the kind of uh, you know bet or uh, investment we can make within uh, within or the kind of decisions we can take within a few hours i think uh, that's a good example of how a good combination of family run businesses and professionals can make yeah yeah absolutely yeah it's a it's it's a dramatic change from the way we have seen the industry grow you know in the in the 90s i mean people were thinking more about how to kind of handle price caps and uh, the immediate next priority was to launch a product so from hundreds of products will get launched uh, i see that uh, changing quite a lot in terms of you know how to kind of improve the quality of revenues um, so you know it's about 15 minutes for us to uh, end the uh, the the discussion but uh, it's important that we take time uh, for questions from uh, people who have uh, very patiently heard us uh, so uh, i'll ask a question put up by uh, my friend here in the chat salil uh, kalyanpur uh we've heard all four leaders talk about access and interchangeably refer to affordability aren't the two concepts different affordability is what pharma can focus on but access is more about infrastructure at the last mile which requires public stroke tax driven financing uh who wants to answer that it's actually true that you know the part of access is about uh, the government infrastructure so if because if i may answer you know yeah, being no. i mean if you talk I mean, if i talk about mankind you know we as a company we started with the smaller towns with the villages with the tier 3 tier 2 towns and in fact you know you would be surprised to know i think we launched delhi and bombay in 2007 and 2009 before that we were not present in these cities so it's all about to be honest you know it's yes you're right to a certain extent infrastructure plays a certain role with respect to a few products but with most of the products i think it's also depends on where the companies want to focus on i think if you ask me as mankind i think uh, a bulk of our sales come in from the smaller towns the rural india and yeah. if you go to the smallest of the villages or the smallest of the towns and you look for medicines i think you will find our products it actually depends on the kind of therapy areas you are present in and uh, what the focus of the company is all about right right if i can also add one more question which has come a lot on mankind is there a plan to list mankind farm so far there is no plan right. not that i know of <laughs> No, but I think it has uh, to add. I think Namita also said right. It, when he say accessibility is also about creating awareness, creating diagnostics. You know, getting uh, awareness. If it's just uh, one company doing it, it's far harder than a lot more companies who are talking about it. Because one critical part we all do is to impart medical uh, information to the doctors and the primary health givers, right? So hmm. that is an important hmm. role that pharmaceutical companies play. And when we have like five thousand, six thousand, eight thousand reps, I mean, one part right. of the critical role is other than creating availability, is to make right. sure that they are obviously parting with all the latest clinical data, science that has been out there for medicine. So that is first. And second is unless in India everything is, I mean, you, if you run consumer business, you know that it is a question of. if you are at the right price you create a larger access because everybody can't afford a particular kind of treatment so many treatments never become primary treatments because for the sheer cost of it so i think when you say accessibility while what what the person says is very true that obviously government has to re play a role infrastructure has to be there primary health centers need to come up and be better equipped but the role mm-hmm. when we say access is to obviously that if you are at a certain price and certain way of marketing you are able to reach far more people in terms mm-hmm. of disseminating the information making the product available as uh, arjun said and uh, mm-hmm. creating diagnostic tools creating awareness so that more diagnosis happens you know for a long period of time breast cancer was a big challenge in our country right and over yeah. a period of time now is far more better than what we were and so it same issue exists with almost every disease the the prevalence is very high the diagnostics yeah. is very less 
the treatment is okay but the compliance is very poor so there are so many things to tackle and as industry we have to look we look at all of these when we talk about access i'm so sure uh, namita would like, like to, to come in here yeah yeah, 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 I, yeah. I'm, i'm really glad sharvil spoke about <laughs> this because these are exactly my thoughts and you yeah. know awareness yeah. is a very important topic vikas and mm-hmm. sharvil spoke about awareness in terms of educating the doctors um and also awareness in terms of just educating the end consumer so i'll give you a simple example in december i came across a world economic forum report where out of 156 countries surveyed india ranked 155th so bottom 2 in women's health and a big part of it is because most women are not aware of symptoms diagnosis going for their annual checks um and so during the pandemic in the last 4 months we started a youtube channel which is a talk show i'm personally moderating it and we have doctors patients sharing their experiences sharing their extremely emotional journeys because along with awareness vikas a very big societal bias in our country especially yeah. in women's health is yeah. uh, the stigmas and taboos associated with talking about women's health and talking about things like infertility and endometriosis and yeah. uh, you know how do we support working women so we've not just done a talk show we've done a massive corporate outreach program and also a outreach in educational institutes under the banner of uncondition yourself that's a very important part of access vikas mhm yeah and you've taken a, a a real keen role in this so if you want to uh, uh, kind of briefly speak about that that will be really interesting to know so it's been an interesting journey because we're definitely going ipo shortly and um, uh-huh. you know there were a lot of questions around uh, would why are you moderating get someone else to do it <laughs> but um, you know i'm a strong believer that if you really want you know I, the word i keep repeating is courage and candor if you really want the courage to come out if you want the candor to come out if you want those real stories from the patients and doctors to come out i mean today you can google any disease and get information uh, on it what people are looking for are experiences and stories and journeys um mm-hmm. and that's why this has been a fabulous experience we've already launched 12 episodes on very critical diseases for me it's been a great learning experience because like arjun said uh, you know i'm a chartered accountant and an mba um i'm mm-hmm. not a science graduate and um, i've really got uh, very deep into science in the last one year and this is what helps me understand the therapies the diseases and ask the right questions um and even for an educated woman like me who is in the healthcare space there mm-hmm. are a lot of things i was not aware about these diseases um so access through awareness is something i feel very passionately about yeah i mean the figures that always keep coming on on these basic primary healthcare is so appalling you know and this this kind of uh, is always curious that we have been having a growing pharmaceutical industry and at the same time it has probably not really uh, kind of percolated to the to the right places and that's where the importance of access comes uh, aman uh, you know you are the chief marketing officer of torrent any thoughts on that how do you want to approach those pockets which have probably remained uh kind of untapped so far yeah uh, so absolutely as uh, and i think the question itself mentioned that uh, this cannot be just a, a one sided effort from the industry it has to be through policy initiatives it has to be through further funding and support and that's where some of the initiatives in ayushman bharat and and other similar uh, programs are are aiming at uh, that how do we provide greater primary healthcare access to as many more people as possible uh, how do we have greater primary uh, screening testing uh, mm-hmm. already there is so much uh, going on going on in the private sector through the organization of testing labs for example organization of hospitals so the private side of the industry is certainly already playing its part uh, the greater access will come through these initiatives uh, which are already on their way so as we see more momentum here uh, we'll see uh, uh, this opening up as well i think the first step is to provide as wide of uh, a primary care as possible and the rest mm-hmm. will follow so that's how we look at it right uh um, uh probably it's time for me to uh, kind of check for the um, 
quick uh, ending statements from all four of you on where exactly do you see the big leap happening? Um, uh, uh, last time when we spoke, uh, Arjun spoke about uh, like a five decades uh, vision of where you want to take the organization. So uh, maybe start with Arjun on exactly what will be your uh, next big leap. So because as I said, I mean, I think the next big leap for us would be innovation, OTC, partnering with uh, other uh, multinational companies, you know, to bring in their therapies or products into India who are not mm -hmm. present or who are looking for more partners. Mm -hmm. Also expanding geographies. Mm -hmm. uh, we are mostly, I mean, most of our revenues come in from India. And mm -hmm. I think uh, we've been... Um, fortunate enough to just focus on India because most of the other markets are not as conducive. Most of the companies which had been focusing on other markets have started focusing back on India. Yeah, so true. The India market is going to be our focus. Uh, we're mm -hmm. going to focus a lot more on new therapy areas, new products, you know, where we are not present and uh, launch much more innovative products, you know, do some sort of innovation into the existing therapies, you know, repurposing a few products. Mm -hmm. So that's where we feel uh, our growth is going to come in from. Definitely, innovation is not just going to be in the products. It, it's also going to come in the way we sell our products, the way we manufacture our products, uh, the way we take our products to the doctors. Innovation mm -hmm. will come in the field of uh, technology as well with respect to digitization, you know, the whole the way whole supply chain works in India. I think uh, the Indian pharmaceutical industry, I think it's at, it's at the right time where you know, where we are expecting a lot of, uh, I would say, a lot of things which are going to happen uh, mm -hmm. with respect to changes uh, in different fields. Because uh, I think we, I can say rightly, I think we are, uh, we are a volcano which is uh, ready to erupt and erupt for mm -hmm. good. Because uh, right. I always take this example, you know, I always narrate this story of, of, of an honest woodcutter. You know, mm -hmm. he, he used to cut woods in his village and uh, he used to cut with a particular Ari, as they say it. And mm -hmm. one fine day, he lost his Ari in the river and he was really crying and was praying to God. And uh, uh, finally, God came and asked him, Kya hua? he said that I lost my Ari and it was my bread and butter without which I would mm -hmm. not be able to, you know, serve my family. So mm -hmm. the God, uh, you know, put his hand into the river and got him an Ari, which was made of gold. He said, God, this is not my Ari. And then the God uh, <laughs> threw that Ari back into the river and pulled out an Ari made of silver. He said that, uh, God, this is not my Ari. Please, <laughs> I need my Ari. So the God finally, you know, thought that he's such an honest man. Let him, let me give him back his Ari. And the God gave him back his Ari and he was extremely happy. So the reason I'm narrating this example is, you know, we as an industry, if we are given the right tools, the right kits and the right things to do, and if we are put in the right ecosystem with the right support from the government and all the stakeholders, I think uh, there's there's lots to be done in the near future. Brilliant. Your story is also so nice to hear. I mean, um, the, uh, and these 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 anecdotal stories really make it uh, so much more lively. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Arjun. Uh, uh, Namita, yours next. Obviously, you you gave out one very important hint about MQR's IPO. Um, of course, in addition to that, you know, I'd like to talk more holistically. One parting remark I'd like to make is, uh, you know, pharmaceutical industry has worked very effectively during the pandemic. Like Sharvi rightly said, all of us said through collaboration. And, um, you know, we've really addressed the shortages issue, the pandemic issue in spite, uh, the production issue in spite of the pandemic. And the one thing I hope is, you know, in India, we have this habit of saying public memory is very short. And I really hope that in this case, that's not true because mm -hmm. we've learned so much from the pandemic in terms of collaboration, quick and streamlined regulatory approvals, digitization, infrastructure, innovation. I hope we don't forget all this post-pandemic. Uh, post and I think at MQR, the vision will remain that how can we use these learnings to take us to the next level of gro growth uh, post-IPO to really address these issues of access, awareness, innovation, digitization, and uh, you know, sort of thinking on our feet and being agile for whenever these 
uh, new issues and new problems crop up as solution providers for the country. Right. Um, I'm tempted to ask you another question. I mean, uh, coming from the reporting background, uh, would you not have wanted to go for a private equity route, uh, Namita? Because, you know, people are waiting for those with, with those big money bags. We've already had two private equity investors. So we had Blackstone first and now we right. have Green Capital. So been there, done that, Vikas. Okay, got it. Perfect. Yeah, let, let public also have uh, the wealth of your growth coming in. Perfect. Uh, Aman, your turn. Uh, the big leap. Yeah, I would say in very uh, few sentences, the big leap for us uh, should be as a, a generic plus player. So a lot of the things that we spoke about, keeping generics at the core, of course, because uh, uh, that will always be a need for India and, of course, the countries that we are currently uh, present in. So generic has to be at the core with uh, a transition uh, towards further research and uh, focusing on research in India for India. Uh, I think the industry has uh, uh, looked at in the past of researching in India, but for other markets and for various reasons that has not worked out very well. Uh, and now it's the time for us to look at researching in India for India. India. Uh, there is tremendous need uh, already that has been established for uh, 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 therapies, particularly for the Indian population. So that's where we see the big leap for us in the next 10 years. Right. Uh, an additional question, I mean, we've already seen the way mucor mycosis is happening. And again, it's because of the excessive use of steroids and uh, there is always a hanging sword of antibiotic resistance. Uh, when you do that research, probably will that be one of your prime focus on antibiotics research? Uh, we have always been a chronic therapy focused organization, so yeah. this would remain more on cardio and diabetes. Yeah. So, All right. Yeah. No, but that, that is going to become a big, big problem uh, going forward because, uh, you know, you see meropenems and tazobactams coming in every prescription. I mean, uh, absolutely. So, so that's where the collaboration will come in. Maybe Arjun and I can discuss the antibiotic uh, collaboration. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, and nothing better than that happening in in course of a discussion. If if collaborations happen, that'll be an ideal situation. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Sharvil, uh, your big leap. So I think for us, uh, the big leap is drug discovery now, and the and right. drug discovery in terms of meaningful now contribution coming through. And we believe in the West Europe and US, we will create. Uh, a specialty business for Zydus, uh, specifically mm -hmm. starting with the US and then uh, extending it to other countries. So that's where we are definitely headed towards. And on the access side, vaccines and biosimilars will play that role for us, which small molecule has done on the access side and affordability side. So that will be the other uh, play which we will have, which will create a larger footprint for us on the generic, uh, better than generic side. Um, and uh, But the true vision for the next 15, 20 years is to really be the specialty company that we want to be by, sure. by having our own drug discovery products, both for the country first always, and then for obviously the other countries as well. And But most of the programs will be global in nature uh, now onwards as we move forward. The other right. is uh, consumer health is a very good area for us and it's been, um, has done well for us and that we will continue to expand and, and build upon. And mm -hmm. my final word also is that, you know, this pandemic has taught us how unprepared and unprepared we mm -hmm. were in terms of what we had to do. So I think better right. foresight is needed for us as a company and obviously for all of us individually. But to how do we be, you know, learn from this and be prepared for what is to come? Because this is not just once in your lifetime kind of thing that's happened. So I think better foresight and better planning uh, in whichever form it's possible uh, to make sure you de-risk yourself and obviously de-risk your company and at the same time make sure that you are better prepared for whatever eventuality there is. Sure. Wow, wonderful. Uh, what to say? I mean, it's been such a lovely conversation, uh, very open, frank and candid discussions. Uh, parts that I really liked were uh, of Namita raising the issue of, uh, you know, encouraging dissent and then that leading into productive uh, you know thought processes 
uh, arjun talking about uh, you know access and affordability and reaching out to people uh, in 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 that uh, bottom of the pyramid segment uh, sharvil your thoughts on looking at international market uh, from the research angle and of course uh, aman's uh, priorities on uh, you know growing as a good chronic company and uh, the fact about doing research for the indian companies uh, for the indian uh, population uh, i think you know this is uh, extremely enlightening for me you know because uh, all of these companies have been small you know uh, when i stepped into uh, reporting uh, in mid 90s these were really, really small companies so now you know there is so much of vision and so much of new thinking uh, i wish you all real uh, good luck and uh, uh, the best uh, uh, in 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 the future uh, with that i also would like to wrap up and uh, uh, thank uh, uh, the teams uh, uh, my own team uh, who've been working really hard for the last one and a half months Uh, the attendees who have been patiently hearing this conversation hopefully this was uh, this was uh, this this had uh, the right benefits for them in terms of understanding where the indian companies are and uh, uh, of course the ipa team which actually facilitated this uh, please stay tuned to et prime prime talk uh, we have a very rich pipeline of uh, discussions and uh, hopefully uh we will ride out the second wave and there will be none of the third wave which we are so badly fearing so thank you so much again uh, aman arjun namita and sharvil all the best to all of you thank you